Well, hey, all of you sheepies near and far. Welcome to worship whenever you're getting a chance to view this. Today is Sunday, the 17th of January, 2021. Let me pray us in. This prayer comes from our United Methodist Book of Worship, 517, and it is a prayer in a time of national crisis. God of all ages, in your sight nations rise and fall and pass through times of peril. Now when our land is troubled, be near to judge and save. May leaders be led by your wisdom. May they search your will and see it clearly. If we have turned from your way, reverse our ways and help us to repent. Give us your light and your truth. Let them guide us through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of this world and our Savior. And all God's people say, Amen. We are in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. This is Jesus' first sermon, sermon in Nazareth, his hometown. And so our message title for today is Kingdoms and Inaugurals. Our nation has certainly been in turmoil. As we step into this week of the inauguration of our nation's 46th president, I am praying for peace as the oath of office is taken. For the most part, when a politician takes their oath of office, they raise their right hand and they place their left hand on the holy book of their choice and swear to uphold the Constitution of the United States. Curiously, there is no constitutional requirement that an elected official take their oath of office on a holy book. Did you know that? For instance, President John Quincy Adams took the oath on a book of laws. But swearing on a Bible is still common practice, especially among presidents, all of whom who have been some form of Christian. JFK was Catholic. Joe Biden will be our second Catholic president ever. Interestingly, most of our presidents, when they take the oath of office, open the Bible to a passage that holds particular meaning to them. The practice has been, has had a historical precedent with George Washington taking his oath on an open page. Apparently, due to a bit of a rush though, the book, the Bible was open to a random passage, Genesis forty-nine thirteen which reads, Zebulon shall dwell at the haven of the sea and shall be for a haven of ships and his border shall be unto Zidon, <laughs> which has nothing to do with his leadership and his presidency at all. The next time an inauguration had a confirmed open Bible was Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural address with the page open to Matthew 7, verse 1. The famous, judge not that ye be not judged. Matthew 7, 1. With the hundreds and thousands of passages in the Bible, it's interesting to see which were repeated by multiple different presidents. Both Dwight D. Eisenhower and Ronald Reagan used 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. Reagan used the verse for both of his inaugural elections, which states, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Both Warren G. Harding and Jimmy Carter used Micah 6, 8, which reads, He hath showed thee, O man, 
what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. The peaceful transition of power is a cornerstone of American democracy. But historically, the inauguration ceremony has not been without its fair share of drama. So it is with our scripture text for today. And so let's dive in to Luke 4, 14 through 30. As our scene opens here midway through chapter 4, Jesus has just been tempted by Satan in the wilderness. There's that word wilderness again that we saw last week as Jesus was baptized by his cousin John in the wilderness. We remember that wilderness reminds us of God's provision. So Jesus had decided to head back home to his hometown for a little R and R. But instead, things got a little ugly. In fact, the townspeople ran Jesus out of town to the edge of a cliff. It wasn't the ideal welcome home party that we would expect to see. Although we shouldn't be surprised by that. Because in the 13th verse of chapter 4 of Luke's gospel, scripture tells us that there will be those kinds of opportunities. So here is our Jesus. He is tired and he is worn out after all. He has just been tempted by Satan in the beginning of chapter 4. This is one of my favorite stories, the, the temptation of Jesus. Because I don't know about you, but there are days when I can hear Satan whisper in my ear, go ahead and jump. Nothing will happen to you. Right? We know that Jesus, just before this, Jesus went down to the muddy waters of the River Jordan to be baptized by his cousin John. That was last week's text. And the heavens open and God claims him. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. Beloved. Remember the word? That words matter? Beloved. Jesus is sealed by the spirit. Hang on to that now because we'll come back to that in just a bit. It's a mountaintop day. It is a celebratory kind of day. And then he goes into the wilderness, led by the Spirit. That's interesting, huh? Led by the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by Satan for 40 days, eating nothing and becoming very hungry. We know there were three temptations. Physical. Go ahead, Jesus. I know that you are hungry, and so if you truly are the Son of God... All you have to do is speak the words and command that these stones here become bread. Go ahead, satisfy your hunger. Jesus, of course, responds with, man does not live by bread alone. Next temptation speaks to greed, want. Well, how about it, Jesus? Just Look at all these kingdoms. You can have them, and you can have authority over them. All you have to do is just bow down and worship me, Satan says. Simple, right? Jesus responds with, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Our third temptation and final one that seems to speak to me. I can almost see the scene play out in my mind. Perhaps you can too. Satan takes Jesus to the, the highest pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem, the holy city. And he's right there, and he, he's on top of the steeple. I love me a, a pretty steeple. And he says, okay, Jesus, if you are indeed the son of God, well, just jump. Just jump. 
For the scriptures say that he will order his angels to protect and guard you. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even scratch your big toe. Emphasis mine. And I love Jesus' response, and I like to make it sort of a breath prayer when I can feel Satan breathing down my neck with those same words. Come on, Lori, just jump. Nothing will happen to you. Jesus responds with, ah. But the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Amen. Then it's finished. The temptations are finished until when? Verse 13 says, When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. Friends, I think sometimes we miss that part. We skip over that last verse. We get comfortable, you know, and we forget that Satan is real and will use every opportunity that he can to try to hold us captive. He weasels in and he finds what pushes our buttons, the things that hold us captive to being a slave to him and of this world rather than being ransomed and rescued and free, a son or a daughter of the king. Are we living a life of captivity or are we claiming free indeed? We need to do better at offering Christ. We need to do better in stepping out of our own little boxes and we need to do better at offering an invitation to a life of freedom rather than holding people captive. This was the issue that day in Jesus' hometown, too, you know? The hometown boy was home. Whoop, whoop! News had traveled that Jesus had been teaching in the synagogue in the region. Now, well, isn't that wonderful? Did you hear? Well... I grew up next door to him, you know. Well, I used to babysit him back in the day. You know, the talk. And now Jesus has the opportunity to teach in, in his hometown synagogue, his hometown church. But it didn't turn out the way that the townsfolk had expected it to because they were expecting for this to be about them. What's in it for them? Surely the hometown boy had a special teaching for them. Well, indeed he did by the power of the Spirit. Inaugurals. Inaugurals are supposed to be celebratory. Pomp and circumstance. But our nation's circumstance at this moment is guarded heavily by the National Guard. The National Mall in Washington, D.C., in which Americans have gathered to be a part of inaugural history so many times before, is now closed off under security because of the events of insurrection of our democracy. Our freedom at the moment feels pretty restricted, and guarded. Jesus' visit to his hometown was also supposed to be a celebration. But it ended in much of the same way. A riot broke out because of his inaugural address and talk of a new kind of kingdom. God's kingdom, always opposite of the world's kingdom. And Luke does such a great job at emphasizing that. When presidents give their inaugural addresses, they usually lay out their agenda, their priorities. Here in the synagogue that day, our Jesus was doing much of the same. 
As the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, Isaiah 61 here now, and Jesus found the place where it was written. He, he, he opened the Holy Scroll. He laid his hand on Isaiah's words, and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that the captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. This is the scripture passage that Jesus has opened as he begins his ministry. Just as these presidential leaders have chosen passages of scriptures in the past, well, past, well, this is Jesus, Jesus' choice. Did you see the three times it emphasizes me? Pertaining to him. Well, everyone gathered was wowed. Isn't this Joseph's son, the carpenter? They were wowed in the moment. Everyone was gracious for the moment until Jesus reminds them that it isn't about them. Uh, ouch. He reminds them, well, you will undoubtedly quote me this proverb of physician heal thyself, meaning, okay then, do miracles right here in your hometown. You know, like you do for everyone else. That's what they were getting at. Dazzle us, Jesus. You're for us, right? But he again reminds them that the prophet Elijah was sent to reach out to a foreigner. So was Elisha. Jesus was sent to set the captives free. And so are we so sent. Jesus was sent to set the captives free, those that had been imprisoned with invisible walls, that those within the church probably put up with their expectations of what church was supposed to look like in the first place. He reminds them that his priority, well, it wasn't for them exclusively, and the them, their pomp and circumstance quickly turned to just circumstance. Let's pause a minute to look at some statistics for this time and place of the year 2021 to give us something to chew on before we continue on here with our text. The Pew Research, Pew as in P-E-W, as in Church Pew Center, measures religious statistics. Some stats from the year 2020 include of people surveyed in the United States when asked if God exists, 56% said that they were certain that God exists. 56%, little over half. While 25% said that they were fairly certain that God existed, of those surveyed and asked how important is religion in your life, 46% said, very important, less than half. 28% said, well, it's somewhat important. And 23% said, it's not important. When those surveyed were asked, how often do you pray? 31% said that they prayed several times a day. 18% said that they prayed once a day. 16% said that they never prayed. I do hope that these statistics challenge us to remember to offer Christ in all that we do. We are called to offer people Christ. People do not need to see our allegiance to a certain political party. 
or even a certain political leader. Even though we live in a nation where our government is a democracy and, and we have the, the freedom and the liberty to elect and support a political candidate and a political party. What people need to see in us, especially in this time and place in our lives, is that our allegiance is to Christ. I think the time of the Lord's favor is upon us. There are too many captives. There are too many who are blind to what Christ has to offer. Freedom. Unlike that of the world, here in this time and place, there are too many living in oppression of labels and life's circumstances. There are too many who live in prisons without walls. Too many who let their past life define them. And boy, Satan seizes an opportunity there too. Too many who hear that little voice of, I don't measure up. Too many who are sealed by the enslavement of sin, not knowing that they can be sealed by the Spirit instead. The time of the Lord's favor is here. And hear the good news. Each of us gets to be a part of that, if we so choose. Where's our allegiance? As Jesus rolled up the scroll, the scroll of Isaiah, as he rolled it back up and he hands it to the usher, the people were wowed and they cheered until Jesus didn't do their bidding. He told them that he came not just for the insiders, but the outsiders. Luke emphasizes that so well too. You've heard me say that, especially he especially came for the outsiders because God's kingdom looks and acts differently than the world's kingdom. What we saw at our nation's capital with flags flying, claiming Jesus is my savior was not the way of God's kingdom. That was not the way of God's kingdom. Jesus is my savior does not belong on a flag. It belongs on a cross. It belongs on a cross. This is the only true freedom. We can't blame the disciples either. They thought Jesus as savior was here to overthrow the government of that day too. And by golly, they, they were ready to stand by him when he did until they saw that their savior was one who didn't fight back, but rather one who acts justly, loves mercy and walks humbly with God. Jesus as savior didn't use force. This savior didn't play to politics or even religious insiders. This savior built up rather than tore down and he exalted the lesser than and he brought the powerful down to their knees. This savior died a brutal death so that you and I could understand what God's freedom looks like. This is what people need to see in us. Last week, I talked about words matter. Words matter. This week, as I was scrolling through my Facebook feed, boy, I had to pause more than once rather than respond in haste. 
pause before post, and ask myself, does this post reflect God's kingdom or the world's kingdom? Does this bring light or does this keep me and others in darkness? Is this the inaugural of Jesus or an agenda of my own? Now, I'm not saying that we have to agree because that time hasn't come yet until Jesus comes back and heaven and earth meet and there is peace on earth, eternal peace. Even Jesus didn't always agree and our, our scriptures reveal that time and, and time again. But what he does give us is some insight some insight on how to live as kingdom people in this time and place. Those statistics that I mentioned earlier are pretty startling, are they not? So how do we challenge them? How do we change them? Well, first we can speak and we can post words of life words of life, and offer new breath to dry bones, to be courageously led by the Spirit and say yes, even when it might look different than what we've always done. To gather together across denominational and political lines, and especially to extend the love of Christ and receive the bread and cup as brothers and sisters in Christ together, as others see the power in that, as opposed to letting our differences hold us captive, stuck, divided. We need people to see the Jesus in us, not the political party, in us. Because the time of the Lord's favor is here, and we are not captives, friends. We are not captives. We are not sealed by slavery. We are sealed by the cross of Jesus Christ. We are bought. We are paid for. We are ransomed. We are rescued. We are forgiven. Amen? This is what defines us. This is what defines us. This is the label in which we wear, not a party affiliation. Hello, my name is, and I am a child of God. Say that. Hello, my name is Lori. And I am a child of God. Live it. Don't listen to those go ahead and jump invitations. And friends, take heart not to offer those go ahead and jump invitations to others. And sometimes the things that we say, words matter, and the things that we post, wound. Wound. They hold ourselves captive, and they hold others captive, too. And that's offering a go-ahead-and-jump invitation to others. Instead, offer people Christ, be sealed by the Spirit, claim it, live it, and be free. Free indeed. This is our kingdom inaugural. Let freedom reign. And all God's people say, Amen. Bye for now. Keep praying. Have a good week.